My countrymen, the first flaming torch of Americanism was lighted in framing the federal constitution in 1787. The pilgrims signed their simple and majestic covenant a full century and a half before and set aflame their beacon of liberty on the coast of Massachusetts. Other pioneers of New World freedom were rearing their new standards of liberty from Jamestown to Plymouth for five generations before Lexington and Concord heralded the new era. It was all American in the destined results, yet all of it lacked the soul of nationality. In simple truth, there was no thought of nationality in the revolution for American independence. The colonists were resisting a wrong, and freedom was their solace. Once it was achieved, nationality was the only agency suited to its preservation. Americanism really began when robed in nationality. The American Republic began the blaze trail of representative popular government. Representative democracy was proclaimed the safe agency of highest human freedom. America headed the forward procession of civil, human, and religious liberty, which ultimately will affect the liberation of all mankind. The federal constitution is the very base of all Americanism, the ark of the covenant of American liberty, the very temple of equal rights, the Constitution does abide and ever will, so long as the Republic survives. Let us hesitate before we surrender the nationality which is the very soul of highest Americanism. This Republic has never failed humanity, nor endangered civilization. We have been tardy sometimes, like when we were proclaiming democracy and neutrality, and yet ignored our national rights. But the ultimate and helpful part we played in the Great War will be the pride of Americans so long as the world recites the story. We do not mean to hold a look. We choose no isolation. We shun no duty. I like to rejoice in an American conscience and in a big conception of our obligations to liberty justice, and civilization. Aye, and more. I like to think of Columbia's helping hand to new republics which are seeking the blessings portrayed in our example. But I have a confidence in our America that requires no council of foreign powers to point the way of American duty. We wish to counsel, cooperate, and contribute. But we arrogate to ourselves the keeping of the American conscience and every concept of our moral obligation. It's fine to idealize, but it's very practical to make sure our own house is in perfect order before we attempt the miracle of old world stabilization. Call it the selfishness of nationality, if you will, I think it's an inspiration to patriotic devotion, to safeguard America first, to stabilize America first, to prosper America first, to think of America first, to exalt America first, to live for and revere America first. Let the internationalist dream and the Bolshevist destroy. God pity him for whom no minstrel raptures dwell. In the spirit of the Republic, we proclaim Americanism and acclaim America. My countrymen, there isn't anything the matter with the world civilization except that humanity is viewing it through a vision impaired in a cataclysmal war. Poise has been disturbed, and nerves have been racked, and fever has rendered men irrational. 
Sometimes there have been drafts upon the dangerous cup of barbarity. Men have wandered far from safe paths, but the human procession still marches in the right direction. Here in the United States, we feel the reflex. Rather than the hurting wound itself, but we still think straight, and we mean to act straight, and we mean to hold firmly to all that was ours when war involves us, and seek the higher attainments which are the only compensation that so supreme a tragedy may give mankind. America's present need is not heroic, but healing. Not nostrums, but normal things. Not revolution, but restoration. Not agitation, but adjustment. Not surgery, but serenity. Not the dramatic, but the dispassionate. Not experiment, but equipoise. Not submergence in internationality, but sustainment in triumphant nationality. It's one thing to battle successfully against the world's domination by a military autocracy, because the infinite God never intended such a program. But it's quite another thing to revise human nature and suspend the fundamental laws of life and all of life's requirements. The world calls for peace. America demands peace, formal as well as actual. It means to have it so we may set our own house in order. We challenge the proposal that an armed autocrat should dominate the world, and we choose for ourselves to cling to the representative democracy which made us what we are. This republic has its ample task. If we put an end to false economics which lure humanity to utter chaos, Ours will be the commanding example of world leadership today. If we can prove a representative popular government under which a citizenship seeks what it may do for the government and country rather than what the country may do for individuals, we shall do more to make democracy safe for the world than all armed conflict ever recorded. The world needs to be reminded that all human ills are not curable by legislation, and that quantity of statutory enactment and excess of government offer no substitute for quality of citizenship. The problems of maintained civilization are not to be solved by a transfer of responsibility from citizenship to government, and no eminent sage in history was ever drafted to the standards of mediocrity. More, no government worthy of the name which is directed by influence on the one hand or moved by intimidation on the other. My best judgment of America's needs is to steady down, to get squarely on our feet, to make sure of the right path. Let's get out of the fevered delirium of war with the hallucination that all the money in the world is to be made in the madness of war and the wildness of its aftermath. Let us stop to consider that tranquility at home is more precious than peace abroad, and that both our good fortune and our eminence are dependent on the normal forward side of all the American people. We want to go on secure and unafraid, holding fast to the American inheritance and confident of the supreme American fulfillment. Mr. Chairman, the message which you have formally conveyed brings to me a realization of responsibility which is not underestimated. It is a supreme task to interpret the covenant of a great political party, the activities of which are so woven into the history of this republic. I believe in party government as distinguished from personal government, individual, dictatorial, autocratic, or what not. It was the intent of the founding fathers to give this republic a dependable and enduring popular government representative in form, and it was designed to make political parties the effective agencies through which hopes and aspirations and convictions and conscience may be translated into public performance. 
Popular government has been an inspiration of liberty since the dawn of civilization. Republics have risen and fallen, and a transition from party to personal government has preceded every failure since the world began. Under the Constitution, we have the charted way to security and perpetuity. We know it gave to us the safe path to a developing eminence which no people in the world ever rivals. It has guaranteed the rule of intelligence, deliberate public opinion expressed through parties. The American achievement under the plan of the fathers is nowhere disputed. The American example has been the model of every republic which glorifies the progress of liberty and is everywhere the leaven of representative democracy which has expanded human freedom. No one man is big enough to run this great republic. There never has been one. Such domination was never intended. Tranquility, stability, dependability, all are assured in party sponsorship, and we mean to renew the assurances which were rendered in the cataclysmal war. Our first committal is the restoration of representative popular government under the Constitution through the agency of the Republican Party. It is not difficult to make ourselves clear on the question of international relationships. We Republicans of the Senate, conscious of our solemn oaths and mindful of our constitutional obligations, when we saw the structure of a world super government taking visionary form, joined in a becoming warning of our devotion to this republic. If the torch of constitutionalism had not been dimmed, the delayed cease of the world and the tragedy of disappointment and Europe's misunderstanding of America easily might have been avoided. The Republicans of the Senate halted the barter of independent American eminence and influence, which it was proposed to exchange for an obscure, and unequal place in the merged government of the world. Our party means to hold the heritage of American nationality unimpaired and unsurrendered. The world will not misconstrue. We do not mean to hold a look. We do not mean to shun a single responsibility of this republic to world civilization. There is no hate in the American heart. We have no envy, no suspicion, no aversion for any people in the world. We hold to our rights and mean to defend. Aye, we mean to sustain the rights of this nation and our citizens alike everywhere under the shining sun. Yet there is the concord of amity and sympathy and fraternity in every resolution. There is a genuine aspiration in every American breast for a tranquil friendship with all the world. My countrymen, we believe the unspeakable sorrows, the immeasurable sacrifices, the awakened convictions, and the aspiring conscience of humankind must commit the nations of the earth to a new and better relationship. It need not be discussed now what motives plunged the world into war. It need not be inquired whether we ask the sons of this republic to defend our national rights, as I believe we did, or to purge the old world of the accumulated ills of rivalry and greed. The sacrifices will be in vain if we cannot acclaim a new order with added security to civilization and peace maintained. One may readily sense the conscience of our America. I'm sure I understand the purpose of the dominant group of the Senate. We were not seeking to defeat a world aspiration. We were resolved to safeguard America. We were resolved then, even as we are today and will be tomorrow, to preserve this free and independent republic. 
let those now responsible or seeking responsibility propose the surrender, whether with interpretations, apologies, or reluctant reservations from which our rights are to be omitted. We welcome the referendum to the American people on the preservation of America. The Republican Party pledges its defense of the preserved inheritance of national freedom. In the call of the conscience of America is peace, peace that closes the gapping wound of world war and silences the impassioned voices of international envy and distrust. Heeding this call and knowing as I do the disposition of Congress, I promise you, formal and effective peace so quickly as a Republican Congress can pass its declaration for a Republican executive to sign. Then we may turn to our readjustment at home and proceed deliberately and reflectively to that hope for world relationship which shall satisfy both conscience and aspirations and still hold us free from menacing involvement. I can hear in the call of conscience an insistent voice for the largely reduced armament throughout the world with a pending reduction of burdens upon peace-loving humanity. We wish to give of American influence and example. We must give of American leadership to that invaluable accomplishment. I can speak unreservedly of the American aspirations and the Republican committal for an association of nations cooperating in sublime accord to attain and preserve peace through justice rather than force, determined to add to security through international law, so clarified that no misconstruction can be possible without affronting world honor. It is better to be the free and disinterested agent of international justice and advancing civilization with the covenant of conscience than to be shackled by a written compact which surrenders our freedom of action and gives a military alliance the right to proclaim America's duty to the world. No surrender of rights to a world council or its military alliance, no assumed mandatory, however appealing, ever shall summon the sons of this republic to war. Their supreme sacrifice shall be only asked for America and its call of honor. There is sanctity in that right which we will not surrender to any other power on earth. My countrymen, the chief trouble today is that the world war wrought the destruction of helpful competition, left our storehouses empty, and there is a minimum production when our need is maximum. Maximum, not minimum, is the call of America. War never fails to leave depleted storehouses and always impairs the efficiency of production. War also establishes its higher standards for wages, and they abide. I wish the higher wage to abide on one ex explicit condition, that the wage earner will give full return for the wage received. It's the best assurance we can have for a reduced cost of living. I am ready to acclaim the highest standard of pay, but I would be blind to the responsibilities that mark this faithful hour if I did not caution the wage earners of America that mounting wages and decreased production can lead only to industrial and economic ruin. I want somehow to appeal to the sons and daughters of the Republic, to every producer, to join hand and brain in production, honest production, patriotic production. Profiteering is a crime of commission. Underproduction is a crime of omission. We must work our most and best else the inevitable reaction will bring its train of suffering, disappointments, and reversals. We want to forestall such reactions. We want to hold all advanced ground 
and fortify it with general good fortune. Let us return to the necessity for understanding, particularly that understanding which concerns ourselves at home. I decline to recognize any conflict of interest among the participants in the industry. The destruction of one is the ruin of the other. The suspicion or rebellion of one unavoidably involves the other. In conflict is disaster. In understanding there is triumph. There's no issue relating to the foundation on which industry is builded, because industry is bigger than any element in its modern making. But the insistent call is for labor, management, and capital to reach understanding. The human element comes first. And I want the employers in industry to understand the aspirations, the convictions, the yearnings of the millions of American wage earners. I want the wage earners to understand the problems, the anxieties, the obligations of management and capital. And all of them must understand their relationship to the people and their obligation to the republic. Out of this understanding will come the unanimous committal to economic justice. And in economic justice, lies that social justice which is the highest essential to human happiness. I'm speaking as one who has counted the contents of the pay envelope from the viewpoint of the earner as well as the employer. No one pretends to deny the inequalities which are manifest in modern industrial life. They are less, in fact, than they were before organization and grouping on either side revealed the inequalities Conscience has wrought more justice than statutes have compelled. But the ferment of the world rivets our thoughts on the necessity of progressive solutions, else our generation will suffer the experiment, which means chaos for our day, to reestablish God's plan for the great tomorrow. My countrymen, the menacing tendency of the present day is not chargeable wholly to the unsettled and fevered conditions caused by the war. The manifest weakness in popular government lies in the temptation to appeal to group citizenship for political advantage. There is no greater peril. The Constitution contemplates no class and recognizes no group. It broadly includes all the people, with specific recognition for none. And the highest consecration we can make today is a committal of the Republican Party to that saving constitutionalism which contemplates all America as one people and holds just government free from influence on the one hand and unmoved by intimidation on the other. It would be the blindness of folly to ignore the activities in our own country which are aimed to destroy our economic system and to commit us to the colossal tragedy which has both destroyed all freedom and made Russia impotent. This movement is not to be halted in throttled liberties. We must not abridge the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, or the freedom of assembly, because there is no promise in repression. These liberties are as sacred as the freedom of religious belief, as inviolable as the rights of life and the pursuit of happiness. We do hold to the right to crush tradition to stifle a menacing contempt for law, to stamp out a peril to the safety of the Republic or its people when emergency calls, because security and the majesty of the law are the first essentials of liberty. He who threatens destruction of the government by force or flaunts his contempt for lawful authority ceases to be a loyal citizen and forfeits his right to the freedom of the republic. Let it be said to all of America, 
that our plan of popular government contemplates such orderly changes as the crystallized intelligence of the majority of our people think best. There can be no modification of this underlying rule, but no majority shall abridge the rights of a minority. Men have a right to question our system in fullest freedom, but they must always remember that the rights of freedom impose the obligations which maintain it. Our policy is not of repression, but we make appeal today to American intelligence and patriotism when the Republic is menaced from within, just as we trusted American patriotism when our rights were threatened from without. We call on all America for steadiness so that we may proceed deliberately to the readjustment which concerns all the people. Our party platform fairly expresses the conscience of Republicans on industrial relations. No party is indifferent to the welfare of the wage earners. To us, his good fortune is of deepest concern. We seek to make that good fortune permanent. We do not oppose but approve selective bargaining because that is an outstanding right. But we are unalterably insistent that its exercise must not destroy the equally sacred right of the individual in his necessary pursuit of a livelihood. Any American has the right to quit his employment, so has every American the right to seek employment. The group must not endanger the individual, and we must discourage groups preying upon one another, and none shall be allowed to forget that government's obligations are alike to all the people. My countrymen, though not in any partisan sense, I must speak of the services of the men and women who rallied to the colors of the Republic in the World War. America realizes and appreciates the services rendered, the sacrifices made, and the sufferings endured. There shall be no distinction between those who knew the perils and glories of the battlefront or the dangers of the sea and those who were compelled to serve behind the lines are those who constituted the great reserve of a grand army which awaited the call in camps at home. All were brave, all were self-sacrificing, all were sharers of those ideals which sent our boys twice armed to war. Worthy sons and daughters, these, fit successors to those who christened our banners in the immortal beginning, worthy sons of those who saved the Union and nationality when civil war wiped out the ambiguity from the Constitution, ready sons of those who drew the sword for humanity's sake the first time in the world in 1898, the four million defenders on land and sea were worthy of the best traditions of a people never warlike in peace and never pacifist in war. They commanded our pride. They have our gratitude, which must have genuine expression. It's not only a duty, it's a privilege to see that the sacrifices made shall be requited and that those still suffering from casualties and disabilities shall be abundantly aided and restored to the highest capabilities of citizenship and its enjoyment. Much has been said of late about world ideals, but I prefer to think of the ideal for America. I like to think there's something more than the patriotism and practical wisdom of the Founding Fathers. It's good to believe that maybe destiny held this new world republic to be the supreme example of representative democracy and order to liberty by which humanity is inspired to higher achievement. It is idle to think we have attained perfection, but there is the satisfying knowledge that we hold orderly processes for making our government reflect the heart and mind of the Republic. Ours is not only a fortunate people, but a very commonsensical people with vision high, 
but their feet on the earth with belief in themselves and faith in God. Whether enemies threaten from without or menaces arise from within, there is some indefinable voice saying, have confidence in the Republic. America will go on. Here is the temple of liberty no storms may shake. Here are the altars of freedom no passion shall destroy. It was American in conception, American in its building. It shall be American in the fulfillment. Sectional once, we're all American now, and we mean to be all Americans to all the world. I would not be my natural self if I did not utter my consciousness of my limited ability to meet your full expectations or to realize the aspirations within my own breast. But I'll gladly give all that is in me, all of heart, soul, and mind, and abiding love of country, to serve us in our common cause. I can only pray to the omnipotent God that I may be as worthy in service as I know myself to be faithful in thought and purpose. One cannot give more. I greet you a spirit of rejoicing. Not a rejoicing in the narrow partisan or personal sense. Not in the gratifying prospects of party triumph. But I rejoice that America is still free and independent and in a position of self-reliance holds to the right of self-determination. Let us take stock for a moment of America in the world. I and of America at home. The end of the war found our unselfishness emphasized to all mankind. The garlands of world leadership were bestowed from every direction. We had only to follow the path of America, rejoicing in the inheritance which led to our eminence, to rivet the gaze of all peoples upon our standards of national righteousness and our conception of international justice. Moreover, the world was ready to give us its confidence. It was the beckoning opportunity of the century, not for the glorification of this new world republic, but for America to hold every outpost of advancing civilization and invite all nations to join the further advance to heights dreamed of but never before approached. But force of example was flung aside for force of armed alliance. We neglected our restoration to home and the sacrifice of millions of lives left us and the world groping in anxiety instead of revealing us in the sunlight of a new day with lines formed ready for the onward march of peace and all its triumphs. Mindful of our splendid examples and renewing every obligation of association in war, I want America to be the rock of security at home, resolute in righteousness and supremacy of the law. Our moral leadership in the world was lost when ambition sought to superimpose a reactionary theory of discredited autocracy upon the progressive principle of living, growing democracy. My chief aspiration, my countrymen, if closed with power, will be to regain that lost leadership, not for myself, not even for my party, though honoring and trusting it as I do, but for the country that I love from the bottom of my heart, with every fiber of my being, above all else in the world. There grows on me the realization of the unusual character of this occasion. Our Republic has been at war before. It has asked and received the supreme sacrifices of its sons and daughters, and faith in America has been justified. Many sons and daughters made the sublime offering and went to hell at graves as the nation's defenders. But we never before sent so many to battle under the flag in a foreign land. Never before was there the impressive spectacle of thousands of dead returned to find eternal resting place 
in the beloved homeland. The incident is without parallel in the history that I know. These dead know nothing of our ceremonies today. They sense nothing of the sentiment or the tenderness which brings their wasted bodies to the homeland for burial, close to kin and friends and cherished associations. These poor bodies are but the clay tenements once possessed of souls which flamed in patriotic devotion, lighted new hopes on the battlegrounds of civilization, and in their sacrifices fed on to accuse autocracy before the court of eternal justice. We are not met for them, though we love and honor and speak a grateful tribute. It would be futile to speak to those who do not hear, or to sorrow for those who cannot sense it, or to exalt those who cannot know. But we can speak for country. We can reach those who sorrowed and sacrificed through their service, who suffered through their going, who glory with the Republic through their heroic achievements, who rejoice in the civilization their heroism preserves. Every funeral, every memorial, every tribute is for the living, an offering in compensation of sorrow. When the light of life goes out, there's a new radiance in eternity, and somehow the glow of it relieves the darkness which is left behind. Never a death, but somewhere a new life. Never a sacrifice, but somewhere an atonement. Never a service, but somewhere and somehow an achievement. These had served, which is the supreme inspiration in living. They have earned everlasting gratitude, which is the supreme solace in dying. No one may measure the vast and varied affections and sorrows centering on this priceless cargo of bodies, once living, fighting for and finally dying for the Republic. One's words fail, his understanding is halted, his emotions are stirred beyond control when contemplating these thousands of beloved dead. I find a hundred thousand sorrows touching my heart. There's ringing in my ears like an admonition eternal, an insistent call. It must not be again. It must not be again. God grant that it will not be. And let a practical people join in cooperation with God to the end that it shall not be. I would not wish a nation for which men are not willing to fight and if need be to die. But I do wish for a nation where it's not necessary to ask that sacrifice. I do not pretend that millennial days have come. But I can believe in the possibility of a nation being so righteous as never to make a war of conquest. And a nation so powerful in righteousness that none will dare invoke her wrath. I wish for us such an America. These heroes were sacrificed in the supreme conflict of all human history. They saw democracy challenged and defended it. They saw civilization threatened and rescued it. They saw America affronted and resented it. They saw our nation's rights imperiled and stamped those rights with a new sanctity and renewed security. We shall not forget, no matter whether they lie amid the sweetness and the bloom of the homeland, or sleep in the soil they crimson, our mindfulness, our gratitude, our reverence shall be in the preserved republic, the maintained liberties and the supreme justice for which they died. Gentlemen of the conference, the United States welcomes you with unselfish hands. We harbor no fears. We have no sordid ends to serve. We suspect no enemy. We contemplate or apprehend no conquest. Content with what we have, we seek nothing which is another's. We only wish to do with you that finer, nobler thing which no nation can do alone. We wish to sit with you at the table of international understanding and goodwill. In good conscience, we are eager to meet you frankly and invite and offer cooperation. The world demands a sober contemplation of the existing order and the realization that there can be no cure without sacrifice, not by one of us, but by all of us. I do not mean surrendered rights or narrowed freedom or denied aspirations or ignored national necessities. 
Our republic would no more ask for these than it would give. No pride need be humbled. No nationality submerged. But I would have emergence of mind committing all of us to less preparation for war and more enjoyment of fortunate peace. The higher hopes come of the spirit of our coming together. It is but just to recognize varying needs and peculiar positions. Nothing can be accomplished in this regard of national apprehension. Rather, we should act together to remove the causes of apprehension. This is not to be done in increase. Greater assurance is found in the exchanges of simple honesty and directness among men resolved to accomplish as becomes leaders among nations when civilization itself has come to its crucial test. It is not to be challenged that government fails when the excess of its cost robs the people of the way to happiness and the opportunity to achieve. If the finer sentiments were not urging, the cold, hard facts of excessive cost and the eloquence of economics would urge us to reduce our armament. If the concept of a better order does not appeal, then let us ponder the burden and the plight of continued competition. It is not to be denied that the world has swung along throughout the ages without heeding this call from the kindlier hearts of men. But the same world never before was so tragically brought to realization of the utter futility of passion sway when reason and conscience and fellowship point a nobler way. I can speak officially only for our United States. Our hundred million, frankly, want less of armament and none of war. Wholly free from guile, you're in our own minds that we harbor no unworthy designs. We accredit the world with the same good intent. So I welcome you, not alone in goodwill and high purpose, but with high faith. We are met for a service to mankind in all simplicity, in all honesty and all honor. There may be written here the avowals of a world conscience, refined by the consuming fires of war and made more sensitive by the anxious aftermath. I hope for that understanding which will emphasize the guarantees of peace and for commitments to less burden and a better order which will tranquilize the world. In such an accomplishment, there will be added glory to your flag and ours, and the rejoicing of mankind will make the transcending music of all succeeding times.